And this panel um, is moderated by Bogdan Hobic from, uh, from Tenderly. And it features uh, Paul, uh, Paul Sandra from BGD Labs and Lucas from BGD Labs and Matt Solomon from Scopelift, Mudit Gupta, who will be joining us from, uh, who's from Polygon and will be joining us via Zoom, and Emiliano Bonassi from, uh, sorry, from Rentable. So come on up, everyone. Thank you so much. Give them a hand. Oh, wow. <laughs> cool. <laughs> <laughs> okay. We're seeing them for the first time as well, so this, <laughs> this is new to us. Hi, Munit Emiliano, can you hear, hear us? <laughs> okay, cool. So, yeah, I I, uh, okay, cool. So we're gonna have to count the lag in here. Thank you, probably, to the most uh, for coming to the probably most complex panel here due to the <laughs> technical issues of connecting people. We can do decentralized things, but we cannot connect to Zoom, Zoom here. And this is this is proof that Web three needs to needs to exist and will prevail. Anywho, all the cringe Web three things aside, I can say hi everyone. My name is Bogdan Habic. I'm gonna be your host for the evening, or. Yeah, we can call it the evening, I guess. It feels like an evening to me, at least. Uh, and I'm going to let all of the panelists introduce themselves, and then we're going to start talking about DAO upgrades and why they're hard. So. Hey, everyone. I'm Matt Solomon. I'm from Scopelift. We're a dev shop, do a lot of smart contract development and things associated to that, uh, one in particular being Seatbelt, which is a tool for governance, safety, and upgrades, which we'll probably get in more into later. Hello. I am Lucas. Uh, I work at B2D Labs, and I basically forked his work. <laughs> this is why I'm here. <laughs> uh, and we are technical contributors to the um, our ecosystem. Yeah. Hello, I'm Paul. I also work at BGD Labs. And um, yeah, I mean, I work right now on some proposals, so I could say some stuff. Uh, guess yes, I'll go next. Hey yes, folks, I'm Modet. I'm CISO at Polygon. I lead security there. And before that, I've worked for DAOs like Sip, which is this one. Cool. Uh, I'm Emiliano. Uh, I'm working on Rentable, a platform for renting NFT without collateral. Uh, I'm an active blockchain security researcher and uh, participating in many workshops and still participating somehow. Yeah, cool. So first of all, the two of them will fight because he forked his work. That's the first <laughs> 20 minutes. Then when one falls, we're going to start. With <laughs> anyway, so to start things off, the idea behind this panel was, I think people don't understand, or we thought that people don't understand how complex governance proposals are, be, uh, are actually are, because it's not just like a yes and no button that you click. There's much more work happening behind the scenes for that thing to actually not, not uh, break everything. So Matt, can you maybe start with what is actually a governance proposal? Yeah, so most smart contracts have like some form of permissioned role in the system, like an admin or an owner who can do things that a regular user can't do, uh, like upgrade parameters or upgrade a smart contract. Um, and sometimes that privileged role is just a regular user. Sometimes it's a multi-sig. Other times it's a DAO. Um, and when it's a DAO, you need some way to get everyone to agree on what should be changed and what should be updated. Uh, and the way to do that is through a governance proposal. So someone submits a transaction that says, you know, we want to do X. We want to change this. We want to change fees from 2% to 1%, um, and people vote on it. And if it passes, that change gets executed. Cool. And then uh, I guess, does everybody agree here, at least on the panel with, with Matt? Or we can start, because we have some polarized questions that will split the room as well. I just wanted to see if we want to start early or not. Or are we guys good? OK. So I guess, Moody, the question for you, this also sounds like a very generic thing, but all, are all proposals made equal? No, not, not at all. At all. So uh, uh, proposals uh, come in by uh, variety. Uh, you can have very basic proposals like uh, uh, deploy on X network, for example. Uh, we know like if uh, a big DAO says that they want to deploy on this new network, uh, almost no token holder is going to vote no. Uh, they are fairly straightforward from the proposal point of view, although the deployment uh, after the proposal can be complex. And then, and then, on the other hand, there can be super complex proposals that can split the uh, whole uh, like token community in two parts. A recent example would be the MakerDAOs. Uh, some people alleged it was a takeover, but basically a new uh, new work being commissioned by Maker uh, 
governance it actually split it on the uh, team or it actually split the whole community in two there were good parties on both sides it was a close race but at the end uh, the proposal didn't pass uh, so yeah, like proposals can be a wide variety of uh, complexity cool and then I guess uh, you said it split the room, but we, maybe we can do something before splitting the room or splitting the whole community itself. So there's a thing called uh, sentiment measuring or temperature measuring. So Paul, can you maybe cover what that is for the audience? Yeah, so f with this, like, we would basically see who of these people like, would like to split the room or not split the room before we actually do it, right? Before we split the room. Exactly. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, so if there's no interest, then there's no need to actually like, create the smart contracts or do the on-chain voting, but yeah. Yeah, uh, what tools are used over there for temperature measuring? Is there something that maybe some... Yeah, I think uh, Snapchat is the, the most commonly used. Basically, yeah. you can vote with your DAO tokens or whatever off-chain, and then from that you can pass to the, the on-chain part. Sure, and yeah. then... Yeah. Yeah, if I can add to sure. this... Um, there's also like a, a forum for most DAOs where people discuss stuff even before doing like a snapshot proposal just to like get a general like sentiment of is this even worth it, right? And then afterwards, um, the, the snapshot is oft often used to like define more like the fine granular stuff that goes into like an actual on-chain proposal. And then Taking those forms into account, did you, for example, see some proposals failing on the forum but people still proposing them in the DAO? I think this didn't happen at Avedao, yeah. <laughs> but uh, probably, yeah, yeah, I mean, there's nothing preventing you from, from actually uh, creating an uh, on-chain proposal. Uh, cool. Uh, so when it comes to creating the proposal, Emiliano, it's very weird because I'm looking at the floor here. <laughs> <laughs> it looks like I'm sick. No, but Emiliano, what actually goes into creating the proposal? Yeah. yeah. Uh, depending on uh, which uh, governance you use, so you know, we have Compound, we have Aave, we have many other ways to, to manage a protocol. You may need different things, but in general, what you need is a smart contract that basically execute the actions on the protocol that change the parameters. Maybe you want to change the collateral factor. You want to introduce a new collateral, or maybe you want to. Uh, add new contracts in, in, in the protocol. But basically, you end up to prepare you know, a, a, a new smart contract. Then you have to decide you know, maybe the parameters for the vote. So you have to specify how much the voting should last, how many people should be required at least to vote. So, quorum. so there are many, let's say, uh, parameters that you uh, could set up. Uh, as soon as you are able to create them, in general, this is something that is done for by one technical people or at least by two people uh, for making the, uh, the the job. Actually, I think that uh, uh, originally was a little bit complex. Now we created a lot of tooling around, uh, around that. But that's basically, in general, the idea. Yeah, you're mentioning smart contracts, and then we always have to mention audits when there's security involved. So I guess a question for Moody, but also for everyone else. We know that the proposals aren't made equal, but should all of them be audited? How much? So it depends on the proposal. The proposal, um, I'd say most of them should be audited. Uh, now, from audit can also come in wide variety. Some can be like just smart contract audits if you're adding a new feature or something like that. Uh, but in terms of governance, usually what I see is uh, the audit needs to be more on the risk management side. So uh, the proposal on Aave, for example, might be to add support for a new asset or remove support from an existing asset. So there won't be any new smart contract involved necessarily. But you need to thoroughly analyze if that asset is uh, stable enough to be added or you know, if it should be removed, what the implications of that are, uh, and so on. So all of these big DAOs, MakerDAO, um, Aave Compound have their own uh, risk assessment teams that take care of all of them. And they go through all of the proposals to ensure nothing bad is going to happen. Then obviously we have some proposals that are for deploying new contracts. So for example, if Aave wanted to deploy Aave V3, Uni wanted to deploy Uni V3, uh, those proposals or smart contracts definitely go through a bunch of audits and uh, those are traditional smart contract audits. Uh, then third type, I would say like some proposals don't need a new audit at all. Uh, 
coming back to an old example of just deploying the contracts on Polygon, for example, if you're live on Ethereum and you deploy on Polygon, like you need it recently, uh, you don't necessarily need a new audit. Cool. And then Emiliano, you were mentioning some tooling here. So do proposals go through UI? Is there like a CACD process? How does the infrastructure look there? And then we're going to have Matt and, and Lucas fight about seat belts, whatever that is so far. But yeah, yeah. yeah. Uh, they are the, the, the best to talk about them because they are one of the best uh, inventor of uh, those tooling. So uh, continuous integration and continuous uh, deployment or anyway, automated tools that keep track of new governance proposals and execute the cash uh, actions against them are pretty useful. Why? Because you want to verify what happened if the uh, uh, proposal get effective, so it will be executed, and you want to generate some reports. So having an, uh, uh, some scripts that run automatically and over all the duration of the voting process to check that everything is uh, going as you expect is pretty fundamental, I would say. Not every governance uh, has them, but we see originally Uniswap having them, we are seeing also Habe having them, this is really important for being sure that when the proposal, but maybe we will discuss later, is going to be executed effectively. So basically, we are changing uh, the protocol, or we are basically executing them. Uh, we get the desired result, and not something that we didn't expect. Sure. So a question for the audience, by the way: Who here is participating at the DAO or running a DAO or something similar? Can you raise your hand? So for the six people in the room that raised their hands, Emiliano, do you think their DAOs need to have this tooling day one, or do you think this is something that can evolve? Can I say day zero? <laughs> <laughs> sure, sure, definitely. And I'm actually glad because I hope we get more people in the space when you see that the problems here are actually very complex. So Matt, coming to you, being, working on one of the first toolings, Uniswap Seedbelt, how, how did you and your team come to the idea? What was the rationale behind it, and what is actually Uniswap Seedbelt? Yeah, so I'll take those in the opposite order, I guess. So it, what it is is pretty much what Emiliano just described. Um, it's a tool that runs in the background every couple of hours uh, for any supported DAO, such as Uniswap, um, Compound's another one it works for. It looks for all proposals for that DAO, simulates them, and generates a report. Um, and we try to make that report as human-friendly as possible. So we you know, use the Tenderly simulator to basically take the raw transaction simulation decode that and say, here's the exact pieces of state that have changed. Here's the events that have been emitted. Um, for all the touched contracts, here's the warnings, uh, et cetera. And basically spit out you know, just a simple file that anyone can read to make sure this proposal does what the creator actually says it's going to do. Um, that way, you don't have to just trust their description, and you can verify for yourself what you're voting on. Um, the reason it came about originally is just because governance is hard. Um, and it's really easy to mess up. And if you do it wrong, people can lose money. Um, you know, sometimes it's easy to recover from. Sometimes it's harder. And so in general, it's just good to take as much precautions as you can with that process. How did, how did it look before Uniswap Seedbelt? Like, what's the before photo of this? Yeah, um, probably very manual. And to an extent, it's still very manual. Um, a lot of the proposals are specific and hard to fully automate um, and fully parse into this like, human-friendly format. And so typically, Someone would submit a governance proposal. They tell you what it's supposed to do. And most voters pretty much just kind of had to trust that that is what's actually happening. Um, now voters have more tools at their disposals to make sure they are educated and informed about what they're voting on. Cool. And then Lucas, you forking his work, what was the rationale? In still in <laughs> yeah, I, I think I, I have to disappoint a bit because I'm not forking it because it was bad or something. It was <laughs> like a really, really good uh, tool. Like it's not a fight that's burning here. Um, <laughs> just that uh, our governance works differently than, than the governance Bravo. Um, <clears throat> Sorry, continue. Uh, so yeah, the, the, we, we had to adjust it slightly um, at different places just to account for how our governance works. And then for the room, maybe, because people always mention governance, and it sounds like one huge thing. How are Uniswaps and Aave's governance different? Like, why did you actually need to fork the work? Um, I think Aave governance, like, this might be wrong. <laughs> but I, I think it was uh, created after governance um, alpha, uh, before the Bravo was, was out. So like, they couldn't like, fork this, so had to do their own research and work. 
Um, so just the, the outcome is slightly different. So what we have on other governance that we don't have on Bravo is, for example, that there's an enforced differential on votes. Um, in, in Bravo, there's only a quorum. Like in, in other governance, there's both. Um, also, in other governance, we have le a very like, fine granular um, control of permissions. There's not only one executor, but there's multiple executors um, touching different um, aspects of the ecosystem. Um, and th there, there's like a, a lot more like smaller, smaller things that are slightly different um, that just allow us not to use the, the exact tooling, but, but adjust it a bit <coughs> to, to account for that. Well, and now Emiliano mentioned reports, so Uniswap, Seedbuild, and Avi Seedbuild generate some reports. Can you paint the picture for people? What, how do people, who and how do they use those reports? Because you mentioned state changes and events, but who's the consumer of that and how do you use it? Yeah, them? so there's kind of two ways you can use them. Um, if you're developing a proposal and if you're voting on a proposal are pretty much the two approaches. And so if you're developing one, you might need to write some code um, that says, you know, send this uh, governance proposal on chain and let people vote on it. And you want to make sure you did that the right way. And so one thing you can do is use uh, the seatbelt tool to simulate that proposal locally and generate the port lo locally. And that way you as a developer can read it, make sure you crafted it the way it's supposed to be before you pay the transaction cost to actually put it on chain. Um, then the second category is the people actually voting. And so what they can do is they can go to the seatbelt repository. Um, it's just on GitHub find the DAO that they're interested in, and then find its specific proposal, and just open the report and read through it. Um, eventually, it'd be nice to have them linked to directly from the proposal page, um, or even embedded. That way, it's more convenient, more people can see it, and you don't even have to leave the page. Cool. And did you guys change anything for the Avis seed belt when it comes to reporting? Was there any additional um, things there? Yeah, so we did the integration in the Avis governance interface to link to the seed belt report. Um, the, we added like the like small small things. We have like the tenderly simulation link in the report, so that like developers can re-simulate the simulation and play around with the state diff. Um, there's some other specific things that are like a bit complicated, like in the um, uh, in the configurator in Ave. There's like some gas golfing to uh, like uh, uh, put a lot of variables in in a single UN256. So it's not, not just a struct, but like a bitmap. And so it's like kind of hard for users to diff different slots and then like realize um, what's happening inside. So we wrote some parser on top to basically interpret like the, the uint and give it in a human readable format for the users and also for the developers who, who want to look at this and see like is the proposal doing what it's supposed to do. And then I guess a question for everyone, like what would you be a, a, your ideal state for these reports? So how do you, how do you in, I don't know, a year, two times, probably, hopefully less, imagine going to a governance proposal? What would you like for developers to see, for audit security people to see, and then for the end user to see as well? So paint your ideal world. Yeah, I, I think like at, at the current state, like the, these reports are, are quite amazing because in the, in the end, like you can, when we say read, like you can see code and numbers that you couldn't able to see. You see like the differential and this stuff, but in reality, like for, for this, I think, to be useful to the general public and not just developers and people expert on the protocol that know exactly like this lot or this refers to this reserve or this token or whatever, like it needs to be like more work on, on representing what this means, right? So I, as a normal user of Ave, for example, I can see, you know, this proposal is to change the percentage or whatever health factor or risk of any token. Anyone else? Or we can continue on this one. Okay, so um, Emiliano mentioned a thing where CICD is very important, important running these tests complete, uh, constantly to know if something changed, but uh, Proposals take something weeks to pass. How can we be sure that once it is passed, it is actually what we wanted for it to do initially? So how can we make sure that all those things execute correctly? Uh, uh, that's how, uh, I think that we, we didn't sort the uh, 
uh, issue yet. I mean, that we, we know effectively, you know, what's going on when we execute, but we can do whatever we, uh, we can do best uh, immediately before. So having a continuous system is very, uh, is very important. Being able to simulate also other protocols, uh, if the proposal is affecting some integration, uh, is, uh, is pretty important. Uh, other things that uh, I see applied not so often is basically uh, conditional execution. So basically when we effectively execute the transaction that changes those states in the protocol. So for instance, we add a new asset, we change the risk parameters or whatever, we can add to the proposal some checks that will be will be verified will be checked effectively in that block and so we revert in the case we are not respecting let's say anymore as some invariant or some conditions so this is pretty important because basically you prepare first with you know seatbelt reporting maybe some block before the execution and then you have, let's say, an effective seatbelt when you execute the, the, the transaction. So my, uh, I would love to see in the future that you know uh, improvement in, uh, for instance, other governance, uh, compound Bravo and whatever. If we will see more, you know, uh, incentivize people to make condition on the proposal that they are going to execute. And then let's split the room. Uh, is DAO governance actually decentralized? Like, how is this different at all from a multi-sig? No, I think, uh, <laughs> yeah, I, I, will, I will start with this. Uh, for me, or, or in my opinion, you can see it as two ways. Like, if, for example, you're in a DAO, and you have maybe the distribution is between three people, right, or something like this, and they basically decide whatever they want. So it's, this is not decentralization, right? But then at the same time, the way of introducing updates or changes to the protocol, a way of like that everyone can, let's say everyone, no? that part of, if it's truly like the token is in, in everyone's hands, like they can decide, they can operate, or everyone can put an update. I think this is the decentralization that is the part of the centralization of this thing. Yeah, I think it kind of varies. Like, yeah, so, uh, oh, go ahead. <laughs> go ahead, Mude. <laughs> go ahead. You're going. <laughs> well, yeah, I was going to say, like, in an ideal world, the answer would always be yes, it's, it's better and more decentralized. In practice, sometimes it's a little more gray, um, kind of like what you were saying. Sometimes most of the tokens are just in the hands of a few people. And so even though anyone can go ahead and buy tokens and participate in governance, um, it's hard to acquire enough to have an impact if the token distribution is kind of lopsided. Um, and you do have to be careful, too. Like, it's not foolproof. There have been, you know, governance attacks where people are able to give themselves all the voting power and then give all the money to themselves. Um, and so you do have to be careful. Obviously, there's trade-offs with the multi-sig where then you just kind of have to trust the people on that multi-sig. Um, but, yeah, I think right now it's kind of mixed. I think in the end, uh, DAOs definitely have potential to be more fair and and equal. Who did? Yeah, sure. So um, I agree with that uh, statement or overall uh, general sentiment that in ideal world, it will obviously be better. But in reality, for 95% of the DAOs, it's actually worse. A bunch of attack vectors can exist this way. I don't remember the exact name, but there was this uh, product which uh, got hacked because someone just bought enough tokens to pass a vote uh, forcefully and just take over the protocol. Um, it is a valid attack vector for multiple protocols. And in fact, a recent example comes to mind. So if anyone remembers the Wonderland project, which once had like almost a billion dollars in AUM, uh, they just gave 25 million, uh, if I remember correctly, 25 million to CP and the vote that transferred that money had only 15 million worth of tokens vote for it. So uh, theoretically someone could have just spent 15 million uh, to get 25 million and uh, like then sold those tokens back to even recoup the 15 million cost uh, they put in. So a bunch of like theoretical attack vectors can exist. Uh, 
in these scenarios in reality only very few have been exploited uh, only that like one first one that like i can't remember the name right now comes to mind uh, but yeah like in general multisex and DAOs aren't uh, too far unfortunately most of the DAOs have big vc investments or foundations that have large enough token holdings to sway vote in any direction they want we have seen some university student groups also sway votes in certain DAOs uh, previously um, so yeah like, it is a big road uh, towards decentralization if I can add something, I uh, agree totally on what, what the other panelists said. I, I, uh, I want to, let's say, say something good for uh, having a governance more centralized, especially not for the DAO stuff, but more for the protocol. I find that not every time, especially at the beginning, uh, users, shareholders have exactly in mind what you know, the protocol needs, how to answer to some questions. So centralization, it's a trade-off because you don't have uh, skilled enough, you know, your shareholders on how you prepare the, the protocol that they're going to use. So I would say that centralization or the multi-sig approach could be effective at some point. We see some, you know, hybrid approach like the delegates, where I can delegate a lot uh, to, to someone else. But I think that depends on the, the at the end, you know, DAOs and protocol are people, so they are not yet automated system. So, uh, you know, the DAOs that emerge from them and all the uh, relationships are just an expression of those. We can put some constraints, but in the end, th they are people. So I would say that uh, I trust maybe more some centralized uh, multi-sig approaches. For instance, Yearn uh, was governed a lot by a multi-sig and worked pretty well. Uh, but there are other problems where there are shareholders that maybe are luggage on executing changes on the protocol because they have to wait for consensus and maybe they are missing time to market for something. So it's not always bad. So I, I would like to say centralization is not bad. Depends how you use centralization. It sounds like synthetic life is the answer here, not. <laughs> yeah. Anywho, sorry for the. Maybe, I, m m maybe I'm biased. <laughs> maybe you're a robot, yeah. So, anyway. So, um, these things sound very complex, and it sounds like if we do something on one protocol, we can screw things up on another one. So, in your experience, how did you guys approach? Like, if, I, if we pass this thing, is it going to screw something up on another protocol because we have the whole money Lego analogy? Can you guys maybe talk about that a bit? I mean, in, in, in Aave, when, when flash loans were introduced, like, it messed up a lot of other protocols. Um, but in, in the governance process, like, there's, there's a risk team. People are usually uh, um, communicating with, with the teams that are affected. And um, there's, like, a... I would say like a good approach of finding a consensus this wo that works out for all. And that's the reason why like there's some governance tokens that are not borrowable because like the community decided we want, don't want to hurt them, right? Like we want to give a, a use to the token and the community wants to be listed um, on, on the other platform, on the, on the other protocol. But um, they want to find a way that, that works out for all. And I think that's that's basically the, the thing, like to, to find a compromise um, on, on a lot of things to before, like analyze what could happen, like if we make maker um, borrowable or, or something. There, there was yesterday like a, a post, I think, to make this like less problematic um, and and help the whole community because no one profits from from uh, other protocol failing. It sounds very interesting because this can be basically a collaboration space for all stakeholders to gather. It's not just like, hey, we ship this thing and we don't care what's actually happening there. So that's a nice side effect there. So um, how can DAOs maybe scale and manage their protocol? Should they like start with a multi-sig? Should they start with just a single wallet? Should they? How can how can they approach this? Maybe Emiliano or actually the whole panel as well, but. <laughs> Yeah, I, I think that uh, a very good approach at the beginning, really, it depends by part of the world. But in general, I think that having a trusted multi sig with many parties, very distributed across the world in the way that you manage the risk is a way to be fast enough for scaling the protocol. Uh, 
but the other problem for me, the other challenge is that as soon as a protocol grows, you have many things that the governor should manage. And so uh, it's hard to imagine, you know, the need of, you know, uh, the governor should approve everything. I mean, it has domain on every part of the protocol. So we, we should have people that are skilled everywhere. So that's, I think that DAOs need to scale somehow. So you have to have uh, small market experts or maybe rules inside the DAO that manage a specific part of the protocol. For instance, uh, in AVB3, you have the risk admins, where basically those are people, there is a permit list where governors can delegate to specific parties, let's say Gauntlet, uh, risk DAO, or whatever, just to be able to tune the parameter for you know the health factor, the LTV, and whatever for for the token. So in that way, a, a governance could be more effective, could act quickly, and could basically answer to the growth of the protocol. So we we, we have to start to see DAOs that split in sub DAOs. And technically, protocols they start to have you know roles inside you know different governors for different parts of the protocol because it's you know separation of concerns. I cannot be skilled on everything around the protocol. Maybe I'm very skilled on the risk. Maybe someone else is more skilled you know on adding new pairs and whatever. Do you guys have maybe an opinion on this as well? I Would fully it? agree. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so. Um, also seeing two tools exist and governance is becoming more and more complex with topics and sub DAOs. Uh, what do you guys think should we maybe stop now, standardize and then continue? Like how would you tackle this? We, we can start with Moodit and then have the whole room. Um, yeah, sure. So, uh, well, uh, the first thing to standardize, I suppose, would be the uh, basic contract structures in most cases, like for basic activities. Uh, for example, a multi-sig standard would be super nice. Uh, everyone kind of defaults to using Gnosis, but there is no like standard interface for a multi-sig. So uh, all of those things can go away. There can be a standard interface for uh, DEXs, for example, in future for lending, borrowing, and so on, so that uh, it becomes easier to analyze these proposals and transactions when you can decode all of the data very easily and say like what exactly this proposal is trying to do. Um, um, right, right now, now when, when the contracts the interact, interact with random other contracts and so on, it can, can be super complex to build tooling and understand what exactly a proposal is trying to do. Cool. Matt? Yeah, I think it's going to be hard to standardize every aspect of the governance flow, but I could kind of see value in standardizing like a process, for example, where the actual steps differ depending on the specific DAO, right? So like, for example, before you submit your governance proposal, it's probably a good idea to simulate it. Um, whether you do seatbelt because it's compatible with your DAO or some other tooling um, because you have something different, it's probably useful to simulate it and make sure the transaction does what uh, you expect it to do. Um, like Emiliano was saying earlier, it's good to continue that process through the life cycle of the proposal. Um, and then once it's finally executed, you want to make sure it didn't have any like downstream second order effects that you didn't anticipate. Um, and maybe you have to monitor other protocols that integrate with yours. Um, and how you do that is going to vary as well. And so I think kind of that high level flow is, is something that maybe could be standardized or, you know, at least talked about more. Sure. Paul, yeah. you had a very interesting opinion. Yeah. Like, I think it, standardizing is nice because in the end, like, different protocols can follow the same pattern. You mitigate risk a bit, but it also is kind of dangerous because then, like, you kind of also mitigate innovation. So if everyone does the same thing, then there's no new things or no better ways, right? So it, it needs to be like quite a, a balance between both. Yeah, kind of along those lines too. Like things change really fast. And so you might standardize something and have a good process today. And tomorrow you're missing like a big new attack vector that shows up um, because people invented flash loans or something like that. Um, so yeah, that's a good point. Yeah. Lucas? Yeah, I would basically agree with that. Um, it's just that at the moment, like th this field is moving very fast. There's there's things in Bravo that are of course better than in our governance, I'd say. 
but there's like the uh, um, the granularity with the multiple executors on Aave, which is like super powerful, and um, there's still like a lot of problems that need to be solved, like to have like cheaper voting, gasless voting, or whatever. Um, and before these things are solved, like I, I feel like one could perhaps slow down um, innovation by trying to standardize too too early. So like standardizing processes, like it's a really good idea, I think, <laughs> to to um, care for some some minimal standard in the industry, um, but also like innovation is still super important in in this field. Yeah, I think maybe creating more or yeah. putting more emphasis on creating more tooling, like so it can support all the steps, right? And then everyone can do their own thing, but you know, supported by all these things that will assure that the final product is a product that can be released. Emiliano, I think you started saying yeah, something. If they cannot, yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> I, I think that the, uh, I agree with uh, all the things said so far. So I think the standardization for me is more around the process. I mean, that if for simpler governance proposal, we have a declarative way of, you know, saying what's the final state of the protocol. Let's say uh, I want that now the protocol, the LTV for the protocol is 50% for that payer and blah, blah, blah. And I have a tool that automatically generates in a very standardized way uh, all these smart contracts and the, the, the things required would be easier also for proposers. So I think that if we are able to have something that uh, simplify the proposal creation despite the effective implementation, is something that improves the readability, engage more people that see that the entry barrier for you know making a proposal is lower because making a smart cotton is just for you know hard things. But in general, if I want to propose, okay, just change these parameters, I have a simple text file where I just change them. And it's basically it's something that we already use in what to work when we declare as a code infrastructure or declare as a code a configuration. So we abstract how we generate the changes with how the final state should be. Cool. And then if someone wants to get started tackling governance and if somebody comes up with a governance tool, what would be a good starting point? As you mentioned, quite a few things. And it's a very complex topic. Hmm. I think maybe the first step, first first step, would be like getting in contact with people that maintain the protocol. I think in more or less in all the main protocols, there are like not one group but multiple groups that do this, and they can like say, yeah, okay, you want to do this? Maybe look at this documentation. Maybe post a forum like uh, whatever you want to do there, and that's for me the first step. I think. Okay, cool. Um, that concludes the panel. Thank you, everyone. Thank you, everyone, for, <laughs> for listening. So listen again, and thank you, everyone, for joining. So, yeah. All right, first step, talk to Lucas. <laughs>